Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning and welcome to FaithBridge. I'm glad that uh, you have chosen to worship with us today, whether you're here in Center Court East Center Court West, if you're up at the Woodlands, or if you're with us online, it's great to have all of you with us. Looking forward to what God has in store for us today. Today is the final message in our sermon series that we've called Unshakable. And during this sermon series, we have been looking at the book of Daniel to consider how we can live in a culture that is becoming increasingly inhospitable to Christianity. And Daniel is an excellent resource for us in that regard because the prophet Daniel knew a thing or two about inhospitable cultures. If you've been with us, you will remember that Daniel was born in the nation of Israel, but when he was a teenager, Israel was conquered by the Babylonians. And he and many others were carted off to Babylon to serve as slaves and came under tremendous pressure from uh, the leaders of Babylon to conform to Babylonian culture. But throughout, Daniel and his peers proved to be faithful and true over and over again. Today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one that can be yours to keep if you have that need. In Daniel chapter 6, we find what is easily the most famous story about the prophet Daniel. Even if you've never been to church, you've probably heard of Daniel and the lion's den. For many of us, it's a story that we have been told from childhood. We're very familiar with the particulars about it. But today, I want to challenge what you think you know about this story. You see, typically we read Daniel in the lion's den as a rescue story, and the focal point, of course, is on Daniel's deliverance from the lions. Hence, we always refer to it as Daniel in the lion's den. But when you take this story and put it against the backdrop of the whole Bible, when you consider what the overarching message of the whole Bible is, Really, the deliverance from the lions is almost incidental. You see, the, the overarching message of the Bible is that God is a God who desires to rescue, but He doesn't want to rescue just one man. You see, God wants to rescue all of humanity from our most basic predicament, sin, captive to sin death, and eternal separation from Him. God is doing whatever He must to move into this world to rescue all of us. And we're going to see in this story a fundamental lesson about God's rescue plan. No matter what sort of culture we live in, no matter how difficult or hostile it may be to our faith, God can use any faithful servant to help accomplish his mission of reaching the world. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's take just a moment and pray, shall we? Father, thank you for today and the privilege that we have to be in your house, the privilege that we have to read your word. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would come to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A while back, I ran into a couple of friends that I had not seen in a long time. And the first thing that they said to me was, hey, have you heard the news? And I said, well, no, apparently I I have not. What's up? And they said, we're moving. And we're moving to the country. Way, way, way out into the country. Now, this was a little surprising for me because I had never thought of this couple as being country folk. I mean, they are pretty suburban through and through. And in a very 
kidding, joking sort of way, I said to them, hey, you guys aren't turning into some of those preppers, are you? Now, for the uninitiated, preppers are people who move into very remote places anticipating the collapse of society, the end of the world. They're going to be ready. They stock up on goods and ammo and guns and, you know, braced for the worst. And as a joke, I I asked, hey, you guys aren't turning into preppers, are you? And to my further surprise, they kind of glanced at each other and said, well, uh, actually, yeah, we kind of are. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Now, normally, I am very measured in what I say. I don't have a reputation for just speaking off the cuff. But before I knew it, I found myself blurting out to them, you know, God told me I could not be a prepper. He told me that if the world is going to hell, he wants me on the front lines doing all that I can to rescue anyone who's headed that way. Friends, that is what you call a conversation stopper. (laughs) Boom. As our culture increasingly grows inhospitable to our faith and to the things that we believe, I have a concern, I have a fear that the body of Christ will increasingly adopt a retreat mode that will pull back into our little enclaves, our little Christian ghettos, and do what we must to protect ourselves rather than stepping out in faith with courage to engage this broken world, to reach out to those who are lost, to reflect the heartbeat of God, which is to rescue fallen and broken humanity. How do we do that? How do we keep from retreating and continue to engage and fulfill the mission that God has called us to fulfill. Well, in this story, we're going to find a three-part pattern for mission that God has used over and over and over in Daniel's life and in the lives of countless people since in order to fulfill his mission for reaching the world. Let's pick it up there in verse 1. It pleased Darius, the king of Babylon at that time, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Part number one of God's missional pattern is this. Influence follows faithfulness. Influence follows faithfulness. If we are living for God in our everyday lives, if we are diligently pursuing Him, if we are choosing obedience over disobedience, if we are choosing faithfulness over unfaithfulness, We're not going to have to look for opportunities to be engaged in mission. God will bring us, move us into places of influence, places of opportunity in order to speak forth a word of truth. God loves his people. God loves his creation. And we don't have to cast about looking for opportunities. If we're living for God, he's going to put us in those places. I mean, imagine Daniel, a foreigner, a slave, and suddenly he is elevated to second in command, second only to the king over the entire kingdom of Babylon. That didn't happen by accident. That happened because Daniel, from the time he was captured and brought into exile, Day after day, week after week, year after year, Daniel proved himself faithful to God. When opportunities came his way to deny God, 
to give in, to settle, to compromise, Daniel refused. And because of his faithfulness, God raised him to a place of influence. This past week, I made a new friend, a friendship that I'm, I'm very excited about and, and looking forward to, to seeing where God is going to lead this. It's with an individual by the name of Yvonne. Yvonne and I had lunch together this week, and he was telling me his, his life story. Uh, about 20 years ago, Yvonne was living in his home country of Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, of course, is a former Soviet satellite, and it is well known for its persecution of Christians, not a hospitable place for Christians at all. He was living there, working as a beekeeper, pretty much just minding his own business, making honey, raising his family, trying to provide for his family. But he had always been a spiritual seeker. He'd always known the truth is out there somewhere. And one day, someone came along and introduced him to Jesus. And in that moment, he said, I knew I had found truth. I knew I had found life. And he began to pursue Jesus for all he was worth. Growing by leaps and bounds, learning to be a disciple, eager to serve and to love God and to grow in his faith. And within a couple of years, God began to work in and through his life to establish a, a core group of disciples. A group of people who are reach, interested in reaching the country of Uzbekistan for Christ. And one of the first things that they did was to plant a church. And before you know it, that little church is planting another church. And that little church is planting another church. And now, 20 years later, from that first church plant that he oversaw, there are over 2,400 new churches in Uzbekistan. You see, when we make up our minds that we're going to live for God and we're not going to compromise, there's no limit to what He can do through us. What about you? Are you pursuing God for all you're worth? Is obedience to Him and faithfulness to Him the most important thing in your life? Are you setting yourself up? Are you putting yourself in a place where God can raise you up and can use you as an influence in the life of our culture, which so desperately needs it. Now, some of you might say, well, look, you know, that, that's fine for Daniel, that's fine for your friend Yvonne, but I, you know, I, I'm just me. I don't have any special training. I'm, I'm no missionary. I'm no evangelist. I think I'll leave it to the pros. I don't think that's the perspective that God has on your life. Don't sell yourself short. You know, Daniel was a slave. Yvonne was a beekeeper. I suspect that everybody who's listening to my voice rates at least that high. Nothing against beekeepers, mind you. A perfectly honorable vocation. But God can use anybody at any time who is sold out to him, who refuses to compromise, who refuses to go along in order to get along. One of my heroes of the faith, a man by the name of D.L. Moody, was a great evangelist in the 19th century. And he is famous for saying that the world has yet to see what God can do through one man who is wholly and fully consecrated to him. I want to be that man. God wants all of us to be that man or woman. God wants all of us to join Him and participate in the work that He's doing here in this broken world. But we need to be ready. Let's read on, picking up in verse 4. At this... The administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. 
So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, and advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep." It strikes me how easy it would have been for Daniel to have completely avoided this fate. I mean, all he had to do was take about a 30-day vacation from praying. Plenty of us do that today with no threat of lions or anything else. All he had to do was just back off for a while, but that was not Daniel's approach. You see, Daniel, Daniel valued faithfulness over convenience comfort, and security. It was more important to him that he be obedient to the living God than to get off scot-free and save his own skin. My friend Yvonne discovered that the uh, Uzbeki government was not really pleased with his activity when the police showed up at his house one day and said, look, it's time for the church planting to stop. It's time for the Christianity to stop. But Yvonne understood, like Daniel, that faithfulness to God is infinitely more important than convenience, comfort, or safety. And so he continued to do what God had called him to do. He discovered in short order that the government meant what they said, and one day he was kidnapped right off of the street, taken to police headquarters where he was interrogated for two days, and then he was deported from his own country. And all the while, he had no contact whatsoever with his family. They did not have the first idea what had happened to him, what his fate might be. You know, from time to time, you and I are going to bump up against resistance. The second part of the pattern is that resistance is inevitable. If influence follows faithfulness, then you can count on it, friends. Resistance is inevitable. You see, when we start to do great things for God, the enemy sits up and takes notice. He's not worried about people who are just floating along with the current, but anyone who begins to swim upstream, anyone who begins to swim against the tide and take a stand for God, the enemy is going to notice and things are going to begin to happen. 
what is our response going to be? Are we going to choose convenience and comfort and safety, or are we going to prove ourselves faithful to the God who gave all in order to save us? God desperately wants to use us, but He can't use us if we're intent on compromising with the world and moving in the other direction. It's not that He doesn't want to, it's that He cannot, because we have rendered ourselves unusable instruments in His hand. What will our decision be? It really does matter. It matters a great deal, as we are going to discover in just a moment, what our decision ultimately will be. God calls every single one of us to serve Him, but He won't force any of us. And when we read stories of Daniel in the lion's den, and we hear things like what happened to Yvonne, the rather obvious question for us at that point is, do I have that kind of spiritual stamina? Do I have that kind of courage that if, if, if I were threatened with jail or with lions, that I would hang in there? That's the obvious question, but you know, I, I think there's a prior question, even before that one. We need to ask ourselves first, am I doing anything in the first place that would even require spiritual stamina? Am I putting myself out there? Am I doing anything that would garner the attention of the enemy? Or am I just staying down below the radar, doing what I have to do to go along and get along? Our choice matters, not just for ourselves. It matters for the world. Daniel found this out in a powerful, powerful way. Picking up in verse 19. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Now, I'll be the first to admit that the rescue of Daniel from the lion's den is an amazing thing. I, I, I don't want to sell God short here at all. It is an incredible miracle and an important part of the story. But it is not the climax of the story. We're not at the end yet. The most important thing of all has not yet happened. The most important thing comes in the very next verses, beginning in 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, and his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Yes, the deliverance from the lions was a miracle of the first order. But you know... I, I don't think it was any great shakes for God to do that. I mean, after all, he made lions. I'm sure he's perfectly capable of keeping a few of their mouths shut. The real miracle of this story is that a pagan king who cared nothing for the living God turned his heart over to him and led his people 
in the worship of him. And even beyond that, began to do missionary work all over the world, writing letters to each and every country, each and every tribe, each and every language to proclaim the new faith he had found. God is infinitely more concerned about a human soul than he is about the mouth of a lion. And the miracle of this story is that God worked through a faithful servant called Daniel. And yes, he rescued him along the way, but the outcome of it all and the thing that really, really matters is that an entire nation came to know God and the entire known world had the chance to hear about God. My friend Yvonne found out that God is good and God is faithful even in the midst of his suffering. He discovered the third and final part of the pattern. Influence brings faithfulness. Resistance is inevitable. But when we are faithful, lives will be changed and God will be glorified. Lives will be changed and God will be glorified. Eventually, Ivan was able to be reunited with his family. It turned out that they had to live in Russia for a couple of years, scratching out a living the best they could. They were not welcome back in Uzbekistan. When two years was up, the Russian authorities came to them and said, okay, here's the deal, you can't live here anymore. But the United Nations is offering you a choice. Three different countries have offered you asylum. You can choose which one to go to. The United States and two other countries. Well, poor Ivan, he did not know what to do. Was it sure the best move to make? But he remembered that about a decade earlier, an American missionary had come through his village, spent some time with Yvonne, and he recalled that this missionary was from this place called the Woodlands, Texas. And he thought, you know, that sounds like as good a place as any. Let's go there. And so they got on a plane and they flew to Houston. He had $1,000 in his pocket. He didn't speak English. No prospects for a job or a place to live. That was eight years ago. Today, because Yvonne chose to be faithful even in the midst of great suffering, today Yvonne leads a ministry, a sports-based ministry that is reaching out to people through the power of competitive sports. And it is a ministry that has grown to the degree that they are now active in 34 different countries around the globe. Hundreds, thousands of people are hearing the gospel because one man was faithful. He started an outreach right here in Houston to the hundreds and thousands of internationals that are coming into our city on a daily basis, just like he did back in 2007. He started a sports outreach to them and it's been so successful that it's now being replicated in 18 other major U.S. cities. All over the globe, lives are being changed and God is being glorified. And while Yvonne would be the first one to tell you that he is immensely grateful for their deliverance and immensely grateful that he's landed here in a country where he is free to do what God has called him to do, he will be the first one to tell you that the greatest blessing of all is that lives are being changed and God is being glorified. Friends, the challenge is before us today. God wants to use you and me every bit as much as he wanted to use Daniel and Yvonne. What will we do? I think it's important to note that since the time of Daniel... Many, many people have stepped into similar situations, choosing to be faithful instead of compromising. But in their circumstances, in the providence of God, they were not rescued. 
they gave their lives as martyrs for the cause of Christ. I think about Paul, the greatest missionary that the world has ever known, executed by Nero. Peter, the rock upon which the church would be built, crucified upside down. Even Jesus himself, the Son of God, was not rescued. But instead, he willingly gave his body to be broken that we might be forgiven. He willingly allowed his blood to be spilled that we might know the love of God and step into that relationship with God and to the hope of eternal life. No, there's no guarantee of rescue along the way. But here's what I do know. If we will be faithful, God will give us influence. And while resistance will come, nevertheless, as we remain faithful, lives will be changed and God will be glorified. The only question that remains is, will we join Him in that mission? As we gather around the Lord's table today, partaking of what are perhaps the most vivid and powerful symbols of God's desire to reach the world, I want to challenge you to think about your role in God's work. Come and receive the grace that the Lord's Supper provides. Come and spend time in prayer if that's what you need to do. But this morning in particular, spend time asking God, what would you have me do? And how can I be faithful in order to be influential so that lives will be changed and you'll be glorified? The ushers in just a moment are going to take their places to guide us to the front. We'll invite you to follow their direction. As you come to one of the various stations that we have here in the front, all of which, by the way, are gluten-free, please take one of the crackers, dip it into the juice, and then partake. You're welcome to stay and pray if that's what you like to do. We'll have prayer partners on hand with red shirts. If you need someone to pray with you, just grab their attention. They'll be happy to do that. If you want to pray after the service, make your way over to the prayer center where folks will be happy to pray with you there as well. We have an open table here at Faithbridge. That is to say, all who have a relationship with Jesus Christ or who would like to have a relationship with Jesus are welcome to come. Will you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for being a God who has not left your broken creation to its own devices. But rather you have stepped out. Your Son left heaven to dwell among us, to live the perfect life, and to die a sacrificial death that we might be rescued. Lord, having received that rescue, how can we turn our backs on those who have not yet heard? We pray, O oh God, that your servant Daniel would inspire us to move out of our comfort zones, to pursue you diligently each and every day, trusting that in your perfect timing, according to your perfect plan, you'll put us in the right place. You'll bring us to the right people. You'll give us that opportunity to speak a word of life. Give us courage when there's pushback. Keep us faithful instead of compromising. And above all, oh God, we beg you, use us to change lives and to bring you glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Care and Bridging Pastor Dan Slagel, who just finished up part five of our series, Unshakable. Welcome, Pastor Dan. Thanks. Yeah, the, what a great message um, and a great finish to this series, looking at how can we have an unshakable faith. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you took a different kind of look at a classic story from the Bible of um, Daniel and the lion's den, mm -hmm. and I think you made a lot of really fresh and relevant points for the culture that we're living in now. We did have a few questions come in. Great. Okay, so I'm just Great. gonna jump right in um, with those. So for this person who wrote in, it seems like God is providing the opportunity for them to influence people from their past. Okay. Um, and they're having a hard time reconciling that. Sure. Um, is it as simple as just trusting God? How, how would one go about that when you have a friend group right. maybe whose influence would influence you a different way. How do sure. you go about influencing them? Sure. Well, the short answer is very carefully. Um, particularly if a person is a relatively new Christian, uh, it is so easy to slip back into patterns and habits uh, that we really don't want now to be a part of our life. And I think in some instances, if, if, if we know that that is a more than likely outcome, we need to entrust those people to other missionaries and believe that God has someone a little more objective to reach them. Now, on the flip side of that, uh, in my own situation, once there was some distance, I'm talking like a decade in my life, I was very much able to enter back into that environment, not be phased in the least. We'd all grown up a little bit for one thing and present a clearer, uh, more mature witness that I think was more effective in the long run. So I, I would look at factors like your own maturity, your own ability to resist temptation, uh, the ability of the audience to receive. You know, Jesus did say, don't throw your pearls before swine. And uh, not that no one is unworthy of receiving the gospel, but sometimes people just aren't at a place where they're wanting that. So using that kind of discernment, tread carefully. Good, that's a good word. So in the, in the message today, you talked about God not being able to use uh, unclean vessels. Okay. There's a little confusion around that for one of our listeners who asked the question. Could you just speak more into that and clarify that for us? Yes. So on the one hand, we are all unclean vessels. All of us sin. All of us are in need of repentance and forgiveness and, and starting over. When I say that God uh, won't use an unclean vessel, uh, He can't use an unclean vessel, I'm talking about someone who is in unrepentant, determined sin. You know, they, they know they need to repent. They know they need to make that change, but for whatever reason, uh, be it an addiction or stubbornness or the devil, it, they're not leaving it. God cannot use that kind of person. Uh, but I think when we approach Him humbly, and uh, as David does in Psalm 51, and seek his forgiveness and his cleansing, we are then made ready to serve. Good, good, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. And so we did have another question come in, um, and I think when you're talking about living in Babylon, um, there is sort of a bridge that's built between faith and politics and the culture. And so this person asked, how can our church bridge the gap mm -hmm. between those, both faith and politics, um, and not allow politics to determine our behavior in addressing others or rejecting them when the Word of God demands that we accept people? Yeah, well, that's a great question, especially as we are entering into the presidential primaries and all of that stuff. Um, Jesus calls us to be salt and light in the world. That means we are qualitatively different from the world. There's nothing wrong with having a political persuasion. Uh, 
we all do, whether we can identify it or not. But we cannot then collapse the two and, and, and make our faith synonymous with any political partner, any political entity. I mean, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, or somewhere in between, none of those are representative of the kingdom. If your primary goal is to be a representative of the, of the kingdom, then the easiest thing to do is just leave politics out of it. And by that, I mean not simply out of your conversations, but be willing to step back and ask yourself, okay, am I wrapping my Christianity up in this party's platform? Am I wrapping myself up in the flag? If that's what you're doing, you, you need to unwrap yep. and step back and let God speak truth into every political entity and party and make your first loyalty to the kingdom and then secondarily to whatever your politics may be. Good, that's a good clarification. Um, what a great end. I love how Thanks. you said our faith shouldn't be just unshakable but unstoppable as well. And so uh, thank you for a great message thank today. You. Thanks for being here with us. Sure. Um, thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.